Hi, everybody. My name is Shauna, and this is the American English Podcast. My goal here is to teach you the English spoken in the United States. Through common expressions, pronunciation tips, and interesting cultural snippets or stories, I hope to keep this fun, useful, and interesting. Let's do it. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Today, we're joined by my good friend, Pete, who is from Australia. And we're going to be talking about housing. Housing is a really fun topic. There's so many things to be said about buying a first home, about what the housing market's been like since COVID. But what is really interesting for me is talking about dream homes. In this chat, you'll hear so many different cool vocabulary words needed to describe houses, the exterior of houses, the interior of a house, everything from the materials needed to make it, uh, parts of the house, etc. It's a very fun topic of conversation for me, and I challenge all of you to think about your dream home. What would it look like? Can you describe it in English? Before we begin, I wanted to share a few of the different terms that you'll hear when listening to this conversation. Let's begin with down payment. When you go to buy a first home, or any home for that matter, you might make a down payment. A down payment is the money that you're willing to pay at once or up front. For example, if I want to buy a house that's worth $500,000, I might put $50,000 down to put money down. That means you're willing to give that money to whoever it is right away. In the U.S., I often hear that first-time homeowners give a down payment or make a down payment of 5 to 20% of the house's cost. But the amount you put down depends on a lot of different factors. In the U.S., there are quite a few programs that exist to help people buy a first home. Uh, one is from the FHA, the Federal Housing Administration, and it's called it the FHA Loan Program. So basically, they ensure that you can get a loan, have an affordable down payment, and affordable closing costs. And there are also programs by the United States government from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, the HUD. One of them that's worth noting is the one that makes it possible for Native Americans, Alaskan Natives, or Native Hawaiians uh, to get into the housing market more easily. The second term we have here is mortgage. Right? A mortgage is the payment that you make in order to buy a home. In the U.S., it's common to have a 30-year loan or a 15-year loan, and during that time frame, you pay your house off. In other words, you make your mortgage payments in order to own your home. In this chat, you'll hear Pete mention the term guarantor. Guarantor, or a co-signer, is someone who signs the papers, the official documents with you, and in effect, they take responsibility of your mortgage if you default on the loan. To default on a loan means to fail to make a payment. You fail to pay back the loan that you took out. Right? We take out a loan from the bank, or you could say that you borrowed money from a lender, someone who lends money. Hi, Pete. How are you? I'm good. How's it going? Good, good, good. <laughs> Today, we're going to be talking about housing and your dream house. And I am so excited about this topic. It's actually a class that I used to have. And it's something that I really enjoyed talking about because by figuring out 
someone's dream house. You get to hear a lot of vocabulary related to houses, so what it looks like from the exterior, also what it looks like on the inside, so the interior of a house. But also, we get to hear about your favorite places in the place where you live, in the country you live. And for you, that's Australia. Pete is from Australia. Pete is the host of the Aussie English podcast. And just before we get going, where can the listeners find you? Just search for Aussie English. You'll find me on YouTube, Facebook, Google, and obviously the website is aussieenglish.com.au and Aussie is spelled A-U-S-S-I-E. Do some people do it with O-Z-Z-I-E? No, but I think it's just a hard word to spell, right? So, you'll end up like a lot of Americans say arsy because they Uh think that the S-S is an S sound in the word Uh as opposed to a Z sound. Yeah, so it is, it's one of those things I never think about it, but it does make much more sense if we were to spell it, say, O-Z-I or something. Mm-hmm. Great. And Z is Z for us, just Australian English and British English. They both use Z, right? The rule is kind of loose. I get in trouble because I always say Z or I, I tend to say, maybe I flip between the two, but Z rhymes at least if you say the ABC. And this was something yes. my... <laughs> Both of our partners are Brazilian, and I was saying to mm-hmm. Kel, my wife, who's from uh, Maranhão, I was saying to her, how do I sing the ABC song in Portuguese? And she's like, what the hell are you smoking? What are you talking about, the ABC song? And I was like, well, in English, we have the A, B, C, D, E, F, G, you know, all the way down to Z or Z at the end. And in English, it sounds way better if you end on a Z because it, rem- it rhymes with all the other letters, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. But if you say Z, it's kind of like, because it doesn't. <laughs> doesn't rhyme with anything but yeah i found out that brazil or um you know portuguese speakers don't have a song at least based on my wife's feedback she's like we don't have a song like that you just learn it the order and i'm like how do you do it though i sit there and i'll be like okay i put things in alphabetical order and i'll be like a b c d e f g h i j k l m p you have to sing the song in your head yes. and, and she's like i don't know i guess we just write it out or think it <laughs> they must have created a song for brazilians uh, on galinha pintadinha which is a program that we watch because it's to the same tune, I believe, but I also asked Lucas about it and he didn't know. What? I've been seeing this since I was probably two. <laughs> right. And it's the same tune to Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, right? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Anyways. Yeah. So that's, that tune's stuck in our head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, let's jump right into this. I'm curious, Pete. Do you own a house? I wish. It's, it's, the housing market in Australia is it's insane, right? And if, it's probably the same for you with COVID having pushed prices up. I don't know. You'll be able to comment. Yes. But here, I think, <laughs> uh, what would you say? Across the entire continent, Australia, the housing prices have gone up 20% in the last year. <gasps> So, like, if you had a house that was worth, say, $500,000 in 2020, it's now worth $600,000 or a million dollars is now $1.2 million. So, they have jumped up a huge amount in Australia and we have this whole housing crisis thing where the average person now, I think, is borrowing six times their annual income to buy a house. Oh, wow. Yeah, and the annual income would be probably around $90,000 Australian. So, that would be if you're in a couple with someone, you're you're borrowing together $1.2 million to get a house. Oh, my gosh. Crazy. Are there any government programs to help people with that? Um, They were talking about, at least recently, there there are quite a few things like first homeowner um, grants or, you know, these schemes. But they tend to have all these rules of like, you have to be building the house, you have to live in the house for a year, you can't like buy a secondhand house and then rent that to someone else, you know. So, there are all these kind of stipulations and, and you know, red tape that you have to uh, fulfill. But it, it tends to be, you know, what, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. So, in the grand scheme of things, it's not a great deal of money. If you have to buy a house from $1.2 million and they're like, oh, we'll give you $30,000 discount, you're kind of like, oh, well, thanks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. And just to kind of get an understanding of the currency difference, do you know the exchange rate between the US and Australia? <laughs> $1.4 Australian to one USD. Okay, good. All right. Well, that's still very expensive for a starter home. How much do you normally have to put down when you're buying a home? Is it 5%, 10%? It depends on your wage. I think too is a big part of it. And like you can, there are sort of ways 
from what I understand, of getting a house with zero deposit, with 5% deposit, with 10 or more. I think generally banks prefer 10% deposit. So, if you want a million dollar house, you need $100,000 saved up so that you've got skin in the game. Because I think I think the basic idea is if you buy the house and then fail on the loan, the bank has got the $100,000 from you and they're not going to lose any money. They've effectively gained money if, if they re- uh-huh. repossess the house. But there are things you can do in Australia, like I could have my parents be guarantors where they would effectively say, we're going to be responsible for the loan if Pete fails on it. And my parents would just be able to buy the house effectively and then sell it, you know, and so they have nothing to really lose. And and you can get mortgage insurance, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But again, that's just extra cost. So you would be Mm -hmm. paying a lot more money on top of the loan than if you had the deposit in the first place, because obviously the the bank will go to the insurance company if you fail. So, Right. Makes sense. So are you looking for housing now? Are you just going to wait until all of this pandemic calms down and maybe there's a housing market crash and houses become miraculously extremely cheap? It, it's uh, tough. Sure. I'm, I'm trying to save up, but at the same time, keep my head above water. So I've, with Aussie English, mm-hmm. we've got a whole team of people that sort of help me. And, uh, you know, they're based in the Philippines and in India. And so I'm trying to keep them in work as well at the same time. So it's been a little difficult to sort of save money, especially with the borders mm-hmm. being closed in Australia and the majority of my... I guess, listeners, followers, um, clients are all generally migrants who've come to Australia and they're in Australia as opposed to, say, people living overseas and and consuming the content. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm trying to save up, but it's been a little difficult during the pandemic. I would like to get a house. But then again, it's one of these tough things. I'm in a situation where I would love to live with my near my parents and my sister and her partner. And they live in a suburb called Ocean Grove. And that's where the prices have just gone berserk. Like, I've been whinging to you about this before, but we were renting there and the prices of houses, you know, for a three or four bedroom house would have been eight hundred dollars to $900,000 at the time. And now when we go back there, so the average in Australia increase was 20%. That suburb is more like 30 to 40%. So, there are some houses there now that are going for like $1.4 million where a few years ago mm-hmm. they were you know, a million or less and you're just like, this is ridiculous. So, that's the difficult thing I think with my generation. One is getting into the housing market but then working out where you're going to be able to afford to live. So, you may have to go a lot more remote or regional away from cities and it's obviously you don't have the right inherently to live where you were born but it's one of those things that a lot of the time you want to be close to family, you want to be close to where you grew up but say, so a suburb like Ocean Grove where my parents could afford to buy there in the 90s, they got their house for one $150,000 and it's now probably worth mm-hmm. over a million dollars. So, it's gone up, you know, nine or ten yeah. times. But the problem is all the people from the cities have found these suburbs mm-hmm. along the coastline. So, Ocean Grove, we live right near the ocean. And mm-hmm. as a result of the pandemic, the crazy thing was we were thinking that the prices were going to crash because everyone would be like, I'm not spending. But they went nuts for houses because everyone was like, I'm getting out of the city. So, they sold all of their houses in Melbourne where the pricing is insane because everyone wants to be close to the CBD in Melbourne. Uh-huh. And they've used the money they had and bought up all the houses regionally that were usually a lot cheaper. So, they've just outbid everyone and the prices went crazy as a result. So, all the big city money has come out into the regions and pushed the prices of um, houses through Mm -hmm. the roof. That's something that also we've seen a lot here in California. I know you've probably heard about the California exodus. Well, is it Uh, it San Francisco where they have like ridiculous rates for rent and for buying houses and everything? It's just insane, isn't it? Yeah, well, so San Francisco, I think it's still considered part of Silicon Valley. So, it's Silicon Valley in general, where there's a lot of tech companies, there's so much money there. What it was in the 90s and the early 2000s is so different than what it is today. Yeah. My friend went there. She's originally from Southern California, from Los Angeles, and she fortunately is with somebody who who has a very good salary. Uh, but they were paying $6,000 a month for a two-bedroom apartment in what? San Francisco. <laughs> Probably like 10000 Australian. <laughs> and, you know, you hear these sorts of things and it's like, it's really hard for me to to fathom just because 
I mean, I live in a suburb. I live uh, outside of Sacramento, which is actually the capital of California. And it's just it's much cheaper where I live. But prices in general in California are soaring. And then in Silicon Valley and San Francisco, they're just San Francisco apparently is now the most expensive city in the United States. Uh, I think it's just because it's it's confined. It's near the bay. There's not really anywhere to go other than, I guess, because you're are surrounded by water. <laughs> So gentrification kind of sends you to another city. The point is, a lot of people are moving out of California. It sounds like similar to Australia, where people are trying to get out, people with a lot of money, and then they move and make prices higher elsewhere. So then because it's ridiculous and we are talking about dream houses, we actually don't have to live in our own reality. This is going to be a little bit more playful. We're going to talk about hypotheticals here. I have actually in front of me five different questions. And there's just simple things on there. East Coast versus West Coast. Would you build versus buy? Two story versus one story, right? So let's go through these little little questions here to build your perfect house and to see what it would what it would look like. So let's talk about location first. Where would you ideally live if you didn't have kids? (laughs) <laughs> if you weren't wanting to live right next to your parents, probably to be close to them, where would you go? Where's the ideal location for you? Do you know much about where the population in Australia is found? The south, right? <laughs> the southeast. The west of Australia is effectively the city of Perth in the southwest. And then okay. everything above mm-hmm. that is just kangaroos. You know, like it's miners. Okay. It's It's the kind of thing, the stereotype you would see where you're going to be driving through Australia and there'll be a sign saying, fill up on fuel because there's no petrol station for the next 500 kilometers. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that's that's that side of the continent. It's very um, sparse, barren. There's not many people around. So the Mm -hmm. East Coast is where I'd prefer to live for that sort of you know reason. Although obviously there's the appealing side of the West Coast where it is really, really beautiful, rugged. And if you are the kind of person who doesn't want to live uh, in suburbia or in a city or surrounded by other people, that's probably, you know, your pick. But yeah, I'd be central east coast, right? So along the east coast of Australia, we have three states, Victoria, well, four if you count Tasmania, the island right at the bottom, but Victoria, then we have New South Wales above that, and then Queensland above that. Queensland takes up about mm-hmm. the top 50% of the state, oh, sorry, of the continent on that side of the continent on the east. And so I'd probably live Mm -hmm. at the bottom of Queensland or the top of New South Wales, which is about halfway up the east coast of Australia. So the weather's really good. The winters are probably as cold as maybe 13 or 14 degrees. So, I mean, Celsius, so not not Fahrenheit, (laughs) because that would be uh, very uncomfortable. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, but that's about room temperature, right? Yeah, a little below, but yeah, that's about as uncomfortable as it would get. And then, you know, Mm -hmm. just nice forests around there, lots of wildlife. You'd see, you know, reptiles, birds. You could go to the beach and see dolphins and Mm -hmm. whales. It's a sort of short drive. You could go north and you can go to the Great Barrier Reef and everything, or you can go south and you can go to places like Sydney and everything. So, it's a, it's a good sort of location to set up shop. Also, I like that because you are a photographer, right? You like to do photography in your free time. And so, it sounds like the ideal situation to be surrounded by wildlife. So pretty much. Can- pretty yeah. much. Exactly. Wildlife and um, the great outdoors. Yes. What other things do you like doing in the great outdoors? Uh, mainly photography at the moment. That's yeah. that sort of passion that got dug up, I guess. My dad kind of calls it. He's been doing photography since I was born, you know, it's just a sort of side project. Uh-huh. And he got me into it. But yeah, I, I, he's a bird photographer mainly. He also does landscapes. But I got into the bird photography side of things because it's kind of like hunting, but you don't have to kill anything. <laughs> right. So, you get to stalk all these animals, you know, lie down, hide in the bushes and then try and get as close as you can and take photos of them sort of in action whilst they're doing interesting things, um, but no one gets hurt at the end of the day. (laughs) Yeah, I like that. I like that. Well, okay, so South, you said South, Central, New Queen, where where exactly? Sorry. (laughs) I would say the Southeast Queensland or Northeast New South Wales. I guess Centre East along the coast there where there's the beach. And a big part of my growing up was always around the coast and with, you know, the Mm -hmm. ocean and everything. So, that's sort of a big part of my life. I don't know if it's a 
it's not really a religious or spiritual thing, but I have this connection with the water and with the ocean. And yes. so, I don't know. My parents are kind of the same. I don't know if I could ever live very, very far away from the ocean where I couldn't either walk there or at least drive there relatively quickly. It would feel very yeah. weird if I was like, you know, a few hours drive from the ocean. Yeah. I think here where I live, it's about an hour, hour and a half or so. But it's also, yeah, it's not the ideal ocean experience. I <laughs> I think Pacific Ocean, I think, is the biggest surprise for people when they come to California and realize that our water is freezing. Pacific Coast water is just so icy cold. You don't want to get in. I mean, up to my ankles is enough. And then I got to get out. So is there an upwelling? Um, is that the reason? Is there an upwelling of cold water that's coming up along the coast there? I think it comes down from Alaska. It's a quick story. I remember I've got cousins in Vancouver and we went there when I was mm -hmm. a kid. And um, in summer, we it was probably the start of your summer. So what's that? I guess like May? June. Yeah, June. Beginning of June. Mm -hmm. They were like, let's go to the beach. And we went to the beach and they're in bikinis and everything. I'm like, you guys are freaking crazy. You know, this is Vancouver. It's it's colder than the coldest place in Australia. And they were like, we're just going to go for a swim. And am I allowed to swear? Or <laughs> I was just like, you, you guys are nuts. Yeah. You guys are nuts. Yeah. The water's yeah. four degrees Celsius, right? So, I don't know. What's yeah. that like? Maybe. So, it would, it would probably be 30, 37, maybe 37 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm. And they were swimming around in bikinis. And I'm like, this is like being in the Antarctic. You guys are nut jobs, you know? <laughs> But you get used to it, you know? I mean, I guess if you're there every day, I never got used to it. And I'm sure um, your beach experience is a little bit different. So where you would live, would the water be warm? Oh, 100%. Yeah, it'd be like 100%. 20 degrees, 20, 24 degrees. Yeah. Ah, oh, that's the life. The trade-off there, though, is that in summer, when you try and get away from the heat, the water, especially if you go into Queensland where we've got the Great Barrier mm -hmm. Reef, the water is like a sauna because you jump in and it's like, you know, 28 degrees Celsius. And so, it's, you know, so as hot as you'd have a bath or something, it's just nuts. And mm -hmm. so, you can't really cool off the same way that where I live currently yeah. in the southeast of Australia, in summer, the water would be more like, you know, maximum of 18 degrees after mm -hmm. summer. So, yeah, it is, mm -hmm. it is really interesting. And so... You're choosing the to be next to the ocean. Are you going to have a beach house with a view? Well, if it's a dream house and you can have whatever you want, it'd be yeah, uh, it'd be either you can walk out the backyard and then onto the sand to get to the beach, or it's on a cliff mm -hmm. overlooking the beach or the the ocean. Mm -hmm. So that'd be pretty cool. All right, and let's get to the nuts and bolts of this. Would you build or buy this house? Yeah. If well, again, if if money's no object and you can do whatever you want, I would probably be building, right? I'd be designing it in and out how yeah. I want it. Um, but if it was already built and it was perfect, I'd have no problem buying a an already lived in secondhand house. And two story, one story, five story. <laughs> What's I think probably two or three, depending on the location, mm -hmm. right? If you're on a hill, like it makes a little more mm -hmm. sense because you can kind of have stories going up the hill but if it was obviously really flat then two is probably enough anything more would be like a, a high rise you know apartment block or something it might be overkill but yeah mm -hmm. I, i've always liked two story houses where you can go up and have a, a better view of your surroundings mm -hmm. you know so that you're not just looking out at sort of eye level <laughs> sea level yeah. land level yeah it's kind of funny the the house i lived in previously it was a two-story house and I used to get so annoyed with the flight of stairs that I would stay downstairs the whole day, <laughs> which I i mean, it's probably the laziest thing I can, you know, probably say. But did you grow up in a two story house or were you in a one story? Oh, it would have been it's kind of it's kind of a weird house because it's built on a hill. My parents place. It's mm -hmm. kind of got one, two, three. It's got three little kind of flights of stairs that kind of change mm -hmm. level. And then there's a big yeah. one at the top that goes up onto the top. So, it's kind of like one, two, there'd be at least four different levels. A split level. Mm -hmm. But they're not specifically stories, like one on top of the other. It's probably yeah. a three-story house that's built up the hill. So, yeah, I've, I've always been used to running up and down stairs. Got you. Yeah. Probably got good calves. <laughs> <laughs> well, I um, did at least. I live in a one-story house now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, let's talk about your 
home. So what would it look like? Do you have an image in your head or you have any ideas about the specifics of the exterior? Good question. Um, in Australia, we have a lot of these old colonial era houses that are made out of mm -hmm. bluestone. So like you'll see these large bluestone kind of, they're probably about 10 times the size of a brick. And the houses have been made out of these mm -hmm. huge bluestone, I don't know, pieces of rock, right? They're not bricks, but they're, they're mm -hmm. much larger. So, I, I don't know. I kind of always liked houses that were made from stone as opposed to bricks or with wooden, um, what are they called? Like uh, the board exteriors where they have like planks of wood laid up. So, I think I'd right. probably mm -hmm. want some kind of stone, at least part of the house have stone walls. Mm -hmm. inside yeah i'd probably have at least four bedrooms just so that there mm -hmm. was you know enough space for the kids and you could create a studio or or um have your own office space uh lounge mm -hmm. room whatever it is and then i would probably also create a studio separate from the house out in the garden somewhere so that i could be shut off and left alone <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah we were just talking about that it's kind of nice to have a space for yourself you know a man cave we call it here in the U.S. Do you, do you use that term as well? Amazing. Yeah, my wife's kind of yeah. raged up a few times. She's like, I'm going to take over that thing. Don't call it a man cave. It's a, it's a <laughs> you know, Pete and Kel cave. And I'm like, it's all good, whatever. You know what I mean? <laughs> but do you feel like it's your cave really? Like when you walk in or there are like, you know, bottles of, you know, whiskey on the walls and like your your books and your things or is it I wouldn't be opposed to having it sort of split down the middle so mm -hmm. one side could be blue the other could be pink I guess you know <laughs> I, I'm not that um if it were my house and everything with my wife I don't mm -hmm. think I would be that possessive that it's like this is my space and you're not allowed in there though if it was yeah. a dream house I'd be like you know what we're just going to create a, a woman cave and you can do whatever <laughs> you want in there and I've got a man cave and I'll do whatever I want in there so you know yes. What about this this house on the outside? Are you going to have like a nice big front porch? When I think about my dream house, I always imagine sort of like a farm style house, you know, a big wraparound porch where I can sit like, you know, a lot of older people tend to do this where they sit in a rocking chair. But I, I don't see what's wrong with that. You <laughs> Just know? watch Everybody's... the world go by. <laughs> yeah, Yell at kids that are walking down the street, throw things at them. <laughs> Get off my lawn. <laughs> yeah. No, but I like I like that having that outdoor space. It's really common in my area of California to have front yards, but people don't use the front yards at all. Whereas in the south and just yeah, southeast of the US, it's really common with like plantation homes and things. A lot of them have those big uh wraparound porches and it's just something that I think it's so it's so nice, you know, to have an outdoor space like that. It's um, funny to so point I'm out here, when you say that, I had to think for a sec, because for me, porch is just the location in front of the front door. That's the porch for me. So, that would be like the the entranceway to the front door. For me, that would be the porch, whereas the rest would be, if it was made out of wood, it would be a veranda, a we would call veranda. it. We have that term too, but we don't use it that often, as often, I would say, as porch. Because we have front porch and back porch. A back porch. See, yeah, yeah I, we would never yeah. use back porch. We would never use it like that. The porch is the place like a, a mailman can uh, deliver stuff. We call him the posty, right? The postman. The posty can deliver things. Yeah. He comes up on the porch. <laughs> That's cute. Yeah, 100%. I, I would really like a veranda. A wraparound veranda too would be really, really cool. Mm -hmm. We usually have a veranda slash balcony on backyards too, especially if they're if they're built on a hill of some kind, like my parents' house, mm -hmm. then we have a, it's called a veranda as well out there, but it's also sort of like a, a balcony. It's about two meters off the ground. You have to go down the stairs to get down to the yard because mm -hmm. it's on a, it's on a hill. It's on a slant. Mm -hmm. um, that is very common in Australia and you'll have the barbie out there, right? The barbecue you'll have, mm -hmm. uh, or we can also call it a deck, deck. in Australia, yeah. a deck. Uh -huh. Yeah. So you'll yeah, have deck yeah, furniture and everything out there. What else? You might have, some sort of shade cloth or something to give you some some protection from the sun mm -hmm. we're kind of the same with you guys i think in that sort of style of not having front yards that are really used much anymore and the, the interesting thing mm -hmm. is so i'm currently in a house that was made by a large company so we have all these companies in australia that you can go to to buy your first home or, or to just mm -hmm. buy a home and they tend to be really really modern houses but 
put together very cheap so they don't cost very much. Um, so there's sort mm-hmm. of it's a two edged blade because you end up with a big house, but a lot of things kind of break pretty quickly. But the interesting thing is that it's kind of morphed now where the size of the house has gotten bigger and bigger in terms of its interior. So you'll want mm-hmm. a four bedroom house, each of the rooms is relatively large, but the land has gotten smaller and smaller so that these yeah. developing companies can fit more of these houses onto the the land they're developing. And so the houses now, mm-hmm. if you were to come to where I live in this suburb, you won't see any space effectively on either side of the houses, maybe two meters max, maybe one mm-hmm. meter on one side, two on the other. And then oh, the wow. front and backyards tend to only be a few meters as well. And all the space is just the house. Yeah. It's actually similar in my town where my parents live. There's very little space in their backyards, not really not yeah. room for very much at all. But downtown, our downtown, I, I don't think it's very old i think 19 early 1900s or so were when the houses were built but the majority of them have such big lots that they can build mm-hmm. an extra house out in the backyard <laughs> that's the sort of place i think if i moved a debate between having a new and fancy home like my parents or having you know a victorian style house in the in the old in the old part of town downtown and having <laughs> extra uh, land to to do stuff on you know Exactly. Just at least have the option. I've had the option. You could Mm -hmm. build a garage, you could build a shed, you could have a barn. I think you guys would call it right, a barn. A garage. (laughs) I like how you said that. How did you say that? I don't know. There's kind of two ways and I've noticed this recently with that word. It's either garage or garage. I think I've heard Australians use both and I it's it's weird. You've probably noticed this too. The more that you teach a language like English and you create content, You'll hear things like different pronunciations and they kind of get so frequent hearing both of them that you'll switch between the two. Like you can hear things like neither and neither, schedule and schedule, these sort of Mm -hmm. two accepted ways of saying the same word. And that happens to me all the time and I'm not even thinking about it. Right. Yeah. Uh, A question on that. (laughs) So Go for it. I think we've talked about this previously, but do you feel like because of entertainment, you use a lot of American words regularly? Yeah. Watching TV. Yeah. I think too, you don't realize just how much you understand. Mm -hmm. I did an episode recently where I was breaking down Ebonics. And I I think that's probably the wrong word now. I think it's like (laughs) African-American vernacular English. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Apologies. I I don't mean to offend anyone, but I always hear about it spoken about Mm -hmm. as as Ebonics. Mm -hmm. But Uh, I remember breaking it down and I understood everything this guy was saying. And he was using a lot of these slang terms, um, Mm -hmm. you know, pronunciation Mm -hmm. of like for sure, you know, instead of for sure Mm -hmm. or for sure, Mm -hmm. as you would say it with the standard American Mm -hmm. accent. And it kind of surprised me just how much I had obviously been exposed to growing up through films, through TV shows, um, podcasts, everything like that, YouTube, because I've only been to America once when I was 12. So that doesn't count. And yet, and I can understand all these things, you know, like it's just crazy. Whereas Mm. the other day I was listening to, um, is it Appalachian or Appalachian? Appalachian. Appalachian. So I was listening to a bunch Mm -hmm. of Appalachian, different accents. These are the sort of, you know, what would you call them? The mountain people. And if you wanted to be politically incorrect, hillbillies or rednecks, right? Where they, not all of them, but some of them. They have these phenomenal accents, but they're really difficult for me to understand because I haven't had exposure. And so, that's the sort of long way of me explaining it. Like, it's really interesting that I understand a lot of African-American pronunciation as well as standard American English pronunciation, expressions, slang terms, the accents. Mm -hmm. But the moment I hear more specific kind of rarer dialects, which is I feel how you guys must feel when you come to Australia. The average American is sort of like, whoa, we never get Australian, you know, content (laughs) to get used to this stuff. That would be like me with Appalachian where I'm just like, all right, it's American. But my God, you know, I barely understand any of this. But I think it's, it's so quick to get used to it. I started actually through Netflix. I think Netflix is changing the world, you know, putting programs in my eyesight that are from England and from Australia, you know, I started watching, um, I'm so on a tangent right now. We're not talking about housing at all, but, um, I started watching an Australian show and I just, you know, I was thinking, what's it called? What's it called? (laughs) Uh, dating on the spectrum. Oh yeah. (laughs) I watched this with my wife. It's so good. I really like it. 
But the funny thing is that there are some things, you know, that I just would never say, like, for example, what do you reckon? And I would never say that. But I think just by being exposed to it, like I could hear myself almost wanting to say it in a certain situation just because because if you came to australia it would hit it would start seeping in and you would pick those things up really quickly because you'd just be surrounded Mm -hmm. by the same if i went to america i would not necessarily change my pronunciation but i would probably start saying slang terms or expressions or maybe Mm -hmm. y'all that sort of stuff because Mm -hmm. i hear it all the time and i know that you guys understand it instantly whereas you find that with americans who come to australia if they're really stubborn and they don't want to pick up the slang or the expressions they constantly stick out like a sore thumb yeah they they never kind of really enter the oh you're one of us like you don't have to have the exact accent of an australian but if you start saying things like g'day what do you reckon these kinds of terms that you're going to hear all the time Mm -hmm. then definitely fit in a lot more than if you were to be stubbornly american outside of america right right certain intimacy that that comes along with you know speaking the way that someone else speaks so yeah, so, well, that's and I you don't realize that. how much you do that, right? Like, it's like that mm-hmm. um, mirroring you do. Like, if, if you hang out with someone, say you go on a date with someone you've never met and mm-hmm. they cross their legs, quite often the other person will cross their legs. Or if they cross their arms, yes. you'll cross your arms. And it, it, you don't realize how much mirroring actually goes on. And it's the same with language. You'll actually match the language they use. So, if they use certain words or expressions you never used before, quite often you'll hear them get the context and use them back in that conversation so that you sort of build a bond yeah it's it's really interesting yes yeah so i believe we got onto this tangent which is a wonderful tangent by the way um by talking about garage (laughs) the term garage and having space and being able to use that space in your backyard for um other things now would you consider building a garden or planting vegetables a little a little patch out in the backyard for for some fresh fruit and veggies. Hey, veggies. Do you guys use that as well, do you? Yes. Ah, mm-hmm. I wonder if you stole that from us. Maybe you've been watching Australian TV. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, I'd probably be interested in it. I'd have like maybe a little mm-hmm. greenhouse so that, you know, you could walk in and everything's separated away from the, the I don't know, the animals, the pesky, the pesky animals that could get in there. Mm-hmm. But I'm a massive fan of the natural environment. So I'd probably also be trying to plant native trees, get native animals in. So, my ideal location for the house would be like having a backyard or front yard that's the beach and then the opposite side of the house would be backing into forest so that you've got all the native animals and everything will just be around. For instance, I remember being at university and we were having to go away on a trip and we went to one of my lecturer's uh, houses. She bought a house up in the, in the countryside and it backed onto a forest. And so, she would get things like echidnas just walking into her backyard, right? These kind of the equivalent of a, a porcupine in Australia, um, although mm-hmm. they're um, monotremes. They're kind of like, like platypus. They lay eggs. But it was wow. just really cool. You'll see kangaroos, all these animals come out of the forest into her backyard because it's right there. So, I would love having a, a forest nearby. Okay. Yeah. So, maybe not so many veggies. and I think they would enjoy eating them. They disappear pretty quickly. (laughs) Maybe to bring the animals in. So I'd have to do it. I'd have to like just plant as many veggies as I can. (laughs) Well, yeah, we, I, I have um, four squirrels that live in my backyard. Actually, it's probably, they're probably more than that nowadays, but they just tear apart my vegetables. (laughs) And I I got to the point where my neighbor says, when I go on vacation, he's going to shoot them. (laughs) (laughs) Is that legal? Can you guys shoot native animals over there? Uh, in California, it it de- it depends because my my brother, for example, my brother will shoot anything. <laughs> People, Place- <laughs> no, there's se- usually separate places where you can go that are designated for shooting times, designated for, um, yeah, for doing that sort of activity, just so you don't run the risk of, you know, shooting a kid or. Surely you wouldn't be able to have the guns in a backyard or you know, even an air rifle or a bow because it could just go over the fence and take someone's eye out, right? I guess it depends on the property too. Like my brother used to go to my my dentist was a family friend and he used to go over to my dentist's house and try and shoot coyote. How does that work? I saw some of these hunting videos recently too and I'm like, aren't they native animals? How do you guys just get out there? And I mean, I think in Australia, the only animal you'd probably be able to shoot that would be native would be kangaroos. And it's because we have more kangaroos in Australia now than, than people 
because of all the cleared land for livestock, mm-hmm. the kangaroo population just exploded. And so they tend to be a big problem. Mm. But I can't imagine you just being like, yeah, I'm going to go out and shoot some echidnas and wombats and koalas. They'd just be like, and you're right. in jail. Well, <laughs> we have some animals that are protected. There, There's a very uh, defined list of which ones you can't you can't mess with and the other ones that you can. Like, So I think our equivalent of your kangaroos would be probably the deer. Anyway, um, that's besides <laughs> besides the point. So your house is backed up to a forest. You'd prefer having these animals coming in, and then you can just sit on your back ver- veranda. No, no. Yeah, yeah, your- yeah. You could say veranda or deck. Technically, the veranda would be kind of like ground level and usually mm-hmm. like wooden planks, right? So you're walking yeah. on wood. That would be the veranda. And then the deck would be the one that's elevated, I think. I think mm-hmm. we kind of use veranda interchangeably for these two because you just think i'm walking on wood (laughs) but Mm -hmm. deck would definitely be the the idea would be that you could go under it and people quite often store things below their decks yes that's how we use it as well so thank you for that explanation that was good and so you would lay out on your deck maybe with your camera (laughs) that'd that'd be pretty cool yeah you'd get like a little hide Mm -hmm. or something that you could Mm -hmm. hide in and then wait for animals to come past and then just snap some shots of them so yeah that'd be amazing i love it one last thing about your house so i am thinking about the house i grew up and i grew up i mentioned before that there were flights of stairs it was also a very crazy house it was custom built so the people that decided to build it had this They were just a little bit crazy, a little bit kooky, and they had a laundry chute. We had walls that could open up and become other rooms. Like they were very weird. Like what? They're yes, yeah. It it was in two different rooms. It had a a tower, uh, with like a wall that I think had eight sides to it, and then one of them opened up to become like a like cub a cubby, so you could hide stuff in there. This is one one of those things that I I think I definitely have to see to understand. (laughs) I don't unfortunately I don't have pictures of the inside I just have a picture of the outside but yeah it was crazy in my room for example there was a a small probably I don't know two feet by three feet I don't know hole in the wall where you could climb in and get to another room it was a wild house some of the features like the laundry chute I definitely liked and I'm just curious to know would you have like a dumb waiter or any other cool feature that you would add to it to make it what was the thing that you just said a, a dumb waiter what what's that i honestly don't know what that is i mean that, that to me sounds have... like someone who's at a restaurant is going to serve you food but they're a moron right they're a dumb waiter <laughs> <laughs> i'm like yeah, yeah we can have one of them in the house <laughs> <laughs> well i guess you could hire some of those you know, in your how dream dumb house. are you are you dumb, dumb waiter. <laughs> No, but that's the the term like it means like a it's like a mini elevator. For example, if you have a kitchen on the bottom floor, you could put food inside of it and have it come up to the top floor. Is it Home Alone where he gets in one of those things and he goes yes. between floors? Ah, yeah. that's what yeah. that's called. We don't have those here in Australia. Okay. So I've never, yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, that's probably a lie. We've got millions of people here. There's probably someone who owns a house with some kind of contraption right. where that happens. Right. But but typically, we don't have those kind of, uh, what would you call ca- the dumb waiters, these little right. lifts. I wouldn't say it's super common here, but for a special dream house, I could imagine it being something, especially if you actually have people as dumb waiters <laughs> downstairs to <laughs> cr- make food for you. It would be very nice to have a dumb waiter. And you don't want to interact a- with them, huh? So you just want them to put the food on <laughs> the little thing and have it come up and you're like, thank you. <laughs> oh, man, you're making me sound bad. <laughs> Hey, you can say I don't have one in my house. How do you, how does it work in a one story house? Is it just going on like a a little conveyor belt or something from one end to the other? <laughs> Honestly, I guarantee that probably exists in some people's homes here in Silicon Valley for sure. And that is the kind of thing that I have just never ever thought about. The other thing that's interesting that I would like to ask you about in terms of houses is it seems like American houses have a lot of cellars. You guys call them cellars, right? Where you have the, they're dug into the ground. The bottom floor of the house is effectively in the ground. A basement or a cellar. Basement mm-hmm. or a cellar. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We don't have those in Australia. So the only person that would have a cellar would be some crazy millionaire who's got like somewhere to put their wine in, in, mm-hmm. their, in their house or something. And so they built an underground thing. Is that because of the cold and because of things like tornadoes, right? In, in the US? 
Exactly. But yeah, I would say in California, it's not common. We don't have that here. Uh, people have attics. So up top to store things. Sometimes but... you have those, but it's very old uh, houses that have the kind of, um, what would you call it, like an arrow shaped roof, whereas modern houses okay. won't have that space that you can just access mm-hmm. to put stuff in. Yeah. Yeah. But you're uh, exactly right with the tornado comment. And you know, you know so much about the US already. Man, I see these I, movies, I, I... Home Alone. You know, <laughs> what do they have downstairs too? They have the heater thing. What's it called? Oh, the furnace? The furnace. That's it. We, don't, <laughs> we would never have that. Like a furnace is somewhere you would put like a dead body to be cremated, right? In Australia. Or uh, you would, you would Creamy. put your, your, we would say cremated. Yeah, or, or or we would um, what would you say? A furnace would be somewhere you would put like ceramics to be fired mm-hmm. if you were making pots or something. Another East Coast thing. I mean, colder weather, California. I feel like we're we're a little bit on the outside. I mean, the south Southwest and stuff. The houses are probably going to look a little bit different over on the East Coast. Um, but yeah, they definitely have those and those dumb waiters as well <laughs> it's so funny how yeah. used to those sorts of things you get you watch american tv and you see them all the time and it doesn't really strike mm. you as weird but if you were to ever think of it in the context of australia it does like you would be like yeah what do you mean you've got a basement with a, a furnace in australia you'd be like where, where, where do you live like at the bottom of tasmania close to antarctica or <laughs> well something? it probably doesn't even get if you said um about vancouver it not even getting as cold as vancouver in the summer so then i i'm sure you probably would never even consider having even a fireplace. Would your dream home have a fireplace? Yeah, we have a lot of fireplaces yeah. here okay. because so the temperatures will get pretty low, at least around where I live. You probably wouldn't have a fireplace in northern Queensland because <laughs> it just yeah. you'd never use it. But here, the temperatures will get to sort of zero degrees Celsius. I guess that that crosses over with Fahrenheit right there. But my grandparents had a log cabin up at a well, they still have it on land up near Bendigo, which is where the gold rush happened in Australia. So it's sort of mm-hmm. quiet. On, on some land and they have a big fireplace where it's made out of um, rocks. And so it was always really fun camping mm-hmm. there or being in the cabin out the front of the, the uh, fireplace. And so, yeah, definitely I'd love to have a fireplace. Mm-hmm. So there's nothing like yeah. it, right? It's Standing so in front of a fireplace on a nice cold night and it just heats you back yeah. up. It's nice. No, it's very nice. Oh, perfect. Well, I actually really like the idea of your house. Would you have any other fun features inside of it or you think just the, the four bedrooms? Lots of bathrooms, a nice big kitchen. <laughs> Man, now that you, you mentioned Island. this other house with all these kind of like hidey holes and nooks and crannies <laughs> that you could like hide in, I don't know. I think I'd probably nice create work. a bunch of those. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Be great to play hide and seek with the kids. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or just hide any of the paraphernalia you didn't want them to right. find. <laughs> oh, Pete. So risque. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Is there anything else you would like to share or talk about? Or are you? you no, that was really good. I, I was hoping, though, to hear about your dream house. We might have to do that in another episode. Uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and just tell you like very quickly about what my dream house would look like. So I think I mentioned before my dream house would be a farmhouse. And location wise, I would pick a place that's near the mountains. I love mountain views. The Rocky Mountains for me are incredibly impressive. So possibly in Colorado or maybe even in Utah, I think would be a nice place. What about Montana? I've heard that's really nice in terms of like the wildlife and and the uh, natural environment. I think at least from my understanding of Montana right now, um, Lucas actually talked about it a while back because I guess John Mayer lived there for quite some time and he was out in the wilderness, like really surrounded by nature. And I think it might be a little bit too much, probably maybe not so in the in the bigger city there, but it just feels a little bit too remote. I like the centralized location of Utah and Colorado and maybe being a little bit closer. I'm not close to Brazil at all, but Lucas's family is from there and it would be nice to be a little bit closer to Brazil. (laughs) I don't know about forest fires in Utah or Colorado, but I would love to be away from California because I, although it sounds very nice to have a nice mountain cabin here, Mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to put that at risk. Like knowing that it could possibly burn down is something that would never make me want to buy. We're going to rebuild every five years. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Especially the the, the more that climate change is having an effect, it's going to be more and more frequent. Yeah, I know what you mean. 
Yeah, but um, beach wise, I so obviously there would be no beach. <laughs> no, <laughs> well, you no. can, if you're in Utah, you could go to Salt Lake, right? <laughs> oh yeah, that's that's true. Yeah, just any sort of lake would be nice. I think mm-hmm. it would be cool to have a nice dock, like where I could jump off and go swimming in the water. Have you seen this, cool. the series uh, Ozarks? No, I think I saw the preview for that. That's on Netflix, right? Yeah, Oz- yeah. I think it's Ozark or Ozarks, but I. Sorry to interrupt you again, but yeah, I was watching that and learning about the um, lakes that they have out there and it was that kind of lifestyle. Every house had like a dock out the back and there were these beautiful lakes and they could just go swimming and stuff and there were forests. So I was like, oh man, that'd yeah. be an amazing place to live. Oh, for sure. Have you ever been to Michigan or like the Great Lakes by chance? I've seen them. No? I mean, okay. I know what they look like. You know, they're, they're <laughs> massive. Great really doesn't do them justice, right? Yeah. and But what's cool about the Great Lake region is there are actually a lot of houses that have a personal lake out back. Uh, my ex boyfriend had a a lake, which is his house wasn't huge, but his house had a lake. It was just normal, and so I think that would be pretty cool to be able to you know maybe get a canoe out, a little boat, you know, kind of paddle around a bit. For the house itself, as I mentioned, I would want a farmhouse, and so I like the idea of having like you a lot of exposed rock maybe inside even having some exposed brick walls four to five bedrooms would be nice i'm not going to have any more kids but it would be nice to have like a a lot of space you know to create different environments in there outside i would want to have like a nice garden i could plant vegetables and the animals wouldn't eat (laughs) just a lot of natural light high ceilings and and very tall windows high windows high windows Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> it would be amazing. That sounds like the house from, uh, what's his name? You know, the guy who plays Jesse out of the TV show Breaking Bad? <gasps> I've seen his house in Idaho. Yes. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Lucas actually uh, showed me a video of his house and he said, you know what? This is my dream house. This yeah. is the house I want to have. And I said, okay, I could, I would be on board. Yeah, exactly. I couldn't believe it. Yeah, it was that sort of thing, right? Lots of exposed rocks, big fireplace, large windows, wooden cabin, um, you know, insane views, crazy forest nearby. I was just yeah. like, God damn, I would live there. <laughs> well, if you ever move to the United States, let me know where you plan on building your, like if it's a remote house, maybe we can build our remote houses somewhat nearby so we can have some friend friend out in the wilderness oh man let's do it we can like yeah. just go to each other's place we can have a shared place to do podcasting it'll be amazing yes <laughs> until then i look forward to visiting your house on the beach sounds like a beautiful beautiful place all right that's it for today's episode i hope you guys enjoyed the chat i had with pete once again you can find pete on the aussie english podcast A-U-S-S-I-E. Before we go, there are just a few things that I want to mention. First thing being, I mentioned a show called Love on the Spectrum. I said Dating on the Spectrum. But in any case, that is a wonderful show for anyone who wants to be exposed to Australian English. Um, Of course, I would definitely recommend Pete's podcast He goes through a lot of language and culture of Australia. He teaches a lot of slang. And other than that, about housing in the U.S., Bloomberg has a few predictions. They say that actually the high property rates in the U.S. is actually due to a shortage of homes. They expect prices to remain elevated. They say that builders are still complaining about the high price for materials the shortage of supplies, and that they actually need a higher number of skilled workers in order to complete new homes. So yeah, let's see what the housing market has for us in the future. Until then, yeah, just keep dreaming and practicing, of course, your conditionals. Hope you're having a nice day and until next time, bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the American English Podcast. Remember, it's my goal here to not only help you improve your listening comprehension, but to show you how to speak like someone from the States. If you want to receive the full transcript for this episode, or you just want to support this podcast, make sure to sign up to premium content on AmericanEnglishPodcast.com. Thanks and hope to see you soon.